Well, on the way over here, uh, I noticed that the weather had changed drastically. It's cold out there. And uh, if you don't like the weather in South Carolina, just stick around for a little while. So uh, one of my first passions before I uh, got into the Word of God was meteorology. When I was five years old, uh, my uncle would always joke around and say, Andy, what's, what's the weather for tomorrow? And boy, I would know. I love meteorology. And uh, if the church never makes it, well, I'll probably go into meteorology. Do something I love. That's what I think. You should always do something you love, and I love teaching the Word, too. But uh, before we get started, and there's no extra charge for this, I'm going to give a little uh, bit on meteorology and why right now it, it should be snowing out there, but it's not. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, I can give you a new one. There's a reason why it's not snowing outside, and that's because we have a ridge of mountains over here to our northwest, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and the wind blows from the northwest in the winter, just like that. Cold. Man, that's some cold air. And it hits them mountains, and when the, the uh, air rises up over the top of those mountains, it cools. And when it cools, it condenses, and then snow starts to fall. So all in here, up in the mountains, you go up to Asheville, it looks like a winter wonderland. I envy those people sometimes. I love snow. But then over here on the other side, you have Spartanburg, Greenville, Anderson, and Gaffney, and then the wind comes down over. This is called the lee side of the mountain over here. And over here we have the windward side. Now on the windward side, it's snowing like crazy. Up in Tennessee, right on the border, North Carolina, Tennessee, Boone, North Carolina, Asheville, it can uh, sometimes start snowing down the valley where Asheville is. And then when it gets over that mountain, the wind starts rushing down like that, and that di dissipates the clouds because it's going from colder air to warmer air, and that means there's no condensation, and the snow doesn't form, and that's called sublimation when it goes from uh, straight from water to uh, evaporation straight to the frozen state. So if we if this ridge were down here, well, I'd have trouble getting here today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the and the weather here is extremely hard to predict predict because of these mountains. A lot of times meteorologists don't know if it's going to rain or snow. So what do they do? They say we got mix coming. What's mix? I don't know. Well, it's just, that's how they cover their butts, because they don't know what it's going to do. If it rains, they'll say, yeah, I told you it was going to rain. You said it was going to snow, too. Well, you know. All right. Well, we're studying sin, and that's what we started with, and now we're getting to more important things. You know, if Brad was just going to be here, I was going to tell jokes all day, but <laughs> no, that, that's not true, though. I would have still taught the doctrine. So uh, we're going to be continuing with the doctrine of sin, and we're going to be studying sin. Now, we're not going to be studying how to sin. We're going to be studying how not to sin, and, and in a way, in a way, we're studying how not to sin, because you can recognize sins. If you, as a believer, uh, don't know certain what certain sins are, you'll just go ahead and commit them. But if you can recognize what is, what is a sin, you can point out the temptation and avoid it. So that uh, this uh, category of the doctrine of homardiology is extremely, extremely important. And by the way, I told Dallas when I was coming in here today, I was going to brag on y'all. In fact, I was going to brag on the young people because you are very well behaved for young people, especially nowadays. In schools, you know how people act in your schools, so I was going to brag on you for that just a little bit. Don't get used to it, though. I might chew you out the next time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So we have, uh, I have up here written, on the way down, down 85, I had these notes that I had made up or that I had uh, put on my computer. And yesterday, after work, I was going to go home and study this like crazy. And uh, I got a migraine headache. And you can't study with a migraine headache. So on the way over here today, I said, well, I'm still going to teach. So I started uh, writing down some notes, and I see on the top of this page here that I wrote the word hypocrisy. And that's because when it comes to sin, a lot of people are hypocrites. And uh, one of the things I was thinking about on the way over, going down 85, that beautiful stretch of highway where you creep like a snail, and um, we're going down through there. And by the way, I'm going down through there and I'm looking down at my notes. 
and it feels like we're moving pretty fast. I'm like, man, how fast? So I look up at the speedometer, and the lead foot over here had us going 82 miles an hour. <laughs> so you better slow down. Pastor don't need to be going to jail tonight. So I was thinking about hypocrisy right before that, and I thought about the fact that uh, in the South, now when I was younger, my grandma would go to uh, the store, and she was a, a Baptist, as most people all around here, and that shows, hip, shows hypocrisy right there because just about every Baptist church you're going to walk in is going to say uh, beer is uh, of the devil and wine is of the devil, and yet on every corner of the street there's a church, and then right beside the church there's a liquor store, and then people who go to church uh, get out of church, and the next day they're in the liquor store sneaking around looking out of the corner of the eye to make sure they don't see anybody they know. And uh, that's the way it occurred with uh, my grandma. She knew, my grandma knew, she was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, she was a member of a Baptist congregation, and she knew it wasn't a sin to partake of a little bit of alcohol. She knew it was a sin to get drunk. And she knew this, and a lot of people know this, uh, but they're going to a church where the preacher teaches against it. So uh, when I remember when I was younger going into the store, when we got to the beer section, and she would go in there and she would look around and then she would pick up the beer and put it in the buggy and then put everything on top of it. Just the eggs here, don't matter, just cover that beer. And sure enough, she would see somebody she knew, but she made sure they weren't going to see that beer in her cart. And that's part of the hypocrisy of it because you're adjusting to people. You're not adjusting to God. And um, if you had any brains about you, you would get that beer and you run across somebody and say, it's not a sin, you can think what you want if they say anything to you about it. And um, But that's part of how people adjust to people. And in this church, it's, it's going to be a wonderful thing because we're not going to have to adjust to people. We're going to learn what's in the Bible, what is actually sin, and what is not sin. Now, we went through the seven sins. I don't know if we actually got through all seven because I, I cut it short a little bit uh, because it was 12 o'clock. But uh, I might have got up to three or four. I might have went past that without numbering it. So we're going to go over those again before we move on to the sins of the tongue and other things like that. So in uh, Proverbs, now I didn't write the chapter down. Uh, it's six, thank you. Six, 16 through 19. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, and this lists the seven worst sins in God's eyes. And in verse 16, it says, There are six things which the Lord hates. In fact, seven are an abomination to his soul. And that, of course, we noted, noted what an anthropopathism is, and that means God assigns a human characteristic to himself just so that... Uh, uh, we can understand what he's trying to communicate to us. And so it says, seven are an abomination to his soul. And then in verse 17, it goes on and lists those sins, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A proud look, as we noted, is arrogance. And that includes everything, which is uh, bitterness, jealousy, vindictiveness, implacability, hatred, self-pity, and sins such as that. And the second is a lying tongue. Now that refers to malicious gossip and slander. Malicious gossip and slander. I'm debating whether to tell you what happened to me today or not. I'll hold off on it and I'll think about it while I'm teaching to make sure it's legitimate for me to talk about it. A lying tongue refers to malicious gossip and slander. Then we have hands that shed innocent blood, and that, of course, refers to murder. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you. I think it'll be fine. I went to church this morning. I got there a little late because, well, not church, to see. I went to work this morning, and uh, I got there about ten minutes late, and that's because the other night I had a migraine, and I wanted to study, and it was very difficult because if any of you suffer from... Uh, any migraine at any time, you know how hard it is to even think. And to look at a computer screen just enhances the pain. So um, finally I get in bed and lay there, and then Dallas's sister calls in the middle of the night. 
And so uh, I have to talk to her for a little while, and I didn't get to bed till about 1 o'clock. And then uh, this morning the alarm went off, and I have one of them. It's very convenient. You just you don't even have to hit a button. You hit the you hit the uh, the whole clock, and it'll just stop. So at about I uh, had it set for what six o'clock. Thing went off. I hit it. I mu- I must have done it unconsciously for two hours because at eight o'clock I wake up and see that it's eight o'clock, and the alarm's going nah 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 nah. And I didn't care. I slept right through it. And so I get ready as fast as I can, get to work about 8.40, supposed to be there at 8.30. And uh, my schedule at work has been a bit erratic lately, not uh, not all because of this, but many reasons. And so I uh, called the boss into office because I thought she should know about it. And I said, you know, uh, my schedule, I've been a little erratic lately. And then I went and told her uh, some of the reasons why and that I like the job. I need to keep it. I need the money. And uh, she was very understanding about all of that. But then she said, do you know what? Uh, We had been gossiping about uh, uh, what actually happened to you. And she said, what we did is we uh, had decided that you had moved back in with your parents. Your wife had moved back to Texas. You were about to get a divorce. And they had made this all up through their their little gossip session. And it was just (laughs) phenomenal. I just busted out laughing. I was (laughs) <laughs> That's unbelievable. And so uh, she went on to talk about that. She said some other things. I can't remember it now, but I was just kind of shocked. <laughs> it, was, it was quite amazing. And that's what they do there. So uh, when when you get around people that gossip, they're going to gossip about you too. And I wasn't even aware of it. And uh, they had my wife committing adultery on me and uh, me with my pot belly living with my mom or something like that. <laughs> and that, <laughs> it was quite interesting. And this is the way sin works, and that's the way gossip works. And gossip is a sin of the tongue. It's actually uh, listed as a part of the worst sins. Now, uh, we laugh about gossip, and uh, of course, and a lot of times it's almost as if our society, and most people do, accept it as a normal way of life. But it's not the Christian way of life. And to live the Christian uh, way of life is to be filled with God the Holy Spirit, and you're less concerned with people and a whole lot more concerned with the Word of God and the fact that you're here on a Tuesday night when there are some good shows coming on. And I promise I won't run past 8 o'clock so that you can watch uh, American Idol or whatever you like to watch. Probably at 9 o'clock I'm going to watch that show House, that new one, that doctor who's a real uh, he's a real sarcastic fellow. I kind of like that personality even though it's, uh, there's sin involved in that too. But that just has to do with personalities. And so, uh, where was I? We were talking about a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And a lying tongue refers to malicious gossip and slander, and hands that shed innocent blood, of course, refers to murder. And we note a pattern from verse 17, and I taught this Sunday, and that is there are three categories of sins listed here. There are mental attitude sins. Those are sins that you can actually commit in your mind. You hate somebody. You are in a state of sin, and you have sins of the tongue, and that's actually a result of mental attitude sins. When you hate somebody, it's going to result in verbal sins, those sins of the tongue. You will talk about that person. And then there is the overt sin, which is listed as murder, and uh, that's a, a result of both mental attitude and sins of the tongue. If you're about to kill somebody, you've probably gossiped about them, you hate them, and uh, you despise them, otherwise you wouldn't kill them. So the overt sin is just a manifestation of the mental attitude sin. And murder, as we noted, is the only overt sin listed in the Bible as the top worst sins. Fornication is not listed. Now, fornication is a sin, and there is great punishment that comes from sexual sins, uh, but in fact it is not in the top seven Sins. And uh, most churches today would probably think so. And today, as I was going down 85, every church I passed, the doors were closed. And that's a travesty. The Word of God, what, what is, well, they're not, they're not there for the Word of God. They're there to have some type of uh, social life, some type of superficiality. And I'll talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> and then in verse 18, a right lobe that devises evil conspiracies and feet that want run rapidly to evil. And we know that last time this is dealing with frustrated people who become conspiratorial. And you have people who are conspiratorial in a church or people who are conspiratorial against any type of authority. 
such as the authority of your teachers or the authority of your boss or uh, something like that, and people get conspiratorial. And when they do that, that is part of the old sin nature and actually part of the worst sin. So we see how prevalent this is today and how many uh, sins people commit without them even even knowing it. And uh, uh, sub uh, subjecting yourself to authority is absolutely um, part of the Christian way of life because without authority you cannot if you reject authority you are not humble and what it takes when you come to learn the word of God is humility it takes a lot of humility to learn the word of God in fact it takes a lot of humility to believe in Jesus Christ and you say well what do you mean by that because when you believe in Jesus Christ you have to set aside Everything you can do in your flesh, you can say, I can work to heaven. Well, that's arrogance. You can't work your way into heaven. So you set all of that aside. And the first humble act that you do as a, uh, an unbeliever, you believe in Christ and become a believer. And that is an act of humility because finally you set aside all of the works that you have been uh, doing and have been justifying yourself with and you say, I count myself worthy because of who and what I am. And then when you believe in Christ, you count yourself worthy because of who and what Jesus Christ is. And that means humility. And humility is very important in life because, um, as we will study when we get to the advanced lessons, but this can be part of basics because it is kind of simple. We have... Uh, people who are called in the Bible vessels of honor, and we have people in the Bible called vessels of dishonor. Now, vessels of honor, these are people who have accepted authority. And usually, <coughs> vessels of honor have accepted the authority of their parents. Now, sometimes they could have rejected the authority of their parents and then suddenly realize the error of their ways and get on doctrine. And that's grace, and that has happened. But in general, a vessel of honor has always started out with respect for their parents. They have obeyed their parents. They might have not agreed with their parents, but they obeyed them. And then, of course, they have an orientation to authority, and when they get in the workplace, they're very successful because they understand the authority of their boss. And, uh, and if they get in school, they're successful. They understand the authority of their coach or the authority of their teacher, and therefore they don't get in a lot of trouble, and they become successful in life. So we have vessels of honor in the Bible, and we also have vessels of dishonor. Now, vessels of dishonor, this does not start in your um, old age. I have the most horrible handwriting on the face of the earth. Vessels of dishonor, but that's okay. I'll just talk. We have vessels of dishonor. Now, that means uh, a lot of times when you don't become a vessel of dishonor overnight. That starts in uh, childhood, actually. And children who disobey their parents automatically are uh, disobeying authority. They will always have trouble when it comes to accepting authority and therefore they can't accept the authority of their parents, well, they'll never accept the authority of their teacher. They'll never accept the authority of a pastor. They'll never accept the authority of their boss. And usually these people end up in jail as vessels of dishonor. And it starts when you're a teenager. A lot of the times the worst mistakes you will ever make is as a teenager. And those decisions can affect, whether you know it or not, your entire life. Now, if you've made a lot of mistakes as a teenager, you can always uh, get with the spiritual life through grace, of course. God has provided that. And if you've been a rebellious idiot, there are a lot of people in jails right now who are listening to Bible tapes. In fact, Colonel Thane had a tremendous ministry to people in prison. They would be sitting there, and finally they would wake up and realize how wrong they've been, but they had to do that. You know, most of them sitting in jail, you know everybody in jail is not guilty. That's what they say when they're in there. I didn't do nothing. I shouldn't be here. Well, you did do something. That's why you're there. 
And a lot of these people wake up and say, you know, I've been uh, wrong. I need an answer to all of this. And therefore, they turn their lives around. And some people have, I'm sure, gone to spiritual maturity sitting in a jail cell for what they've done. And that's the grace of God. But as a way of principle, if you uh, disobey your parents, and you uh, dishonor your parents, you are a vessel of dishonor, and your life is on a road toward destruction. And a vessel of honor, of course, is sub, uh, sub, submits to authority. And that's very important when it comes to sin, um, as we are studying now, because the first thing you do as a believer, the first act of humility you commit as a believer, is when you finally name your sin to God, because finally you admit that you are wrong, you admit that you have sinned. So that is the first act of humility as a believer. So humility is an intricate part of the Christian way of life, and I'm not talking about a false humility, a uh, uh, hypocrisy-type humility where people try to uh, act a certain way to look humble. I'm talking about true humility, which is accepting authority. Therefore, as part of the worst sins, there are frustrated people who become conspiratorial. That is the vessels of dishonor who become conspiratorial. And when authority makes them feel uncomfortable in any way, they do everything they can to undermine authority. And uh, as I was saying, as point of principle, this sin refers to children who undermine the authority of their parents. Your parents has a, have an authority over you for your protection. They're not wielding their authority. That is, if they're good, some parents do, and there is some uh, child abuse. And we'll get into that in Matthew when we get into the study of Matthew, and I can't wait to get there. And that's why I have expanded the classes from two on Sunday to two this week. I'll see how I hold up. I might expand it more and if there's a, if there's a demand for it. And therefore... Uh, that we will continue with this so that we can get through the basics and you can move on to something that is phenomenal and to live the uh, unique spiritual life really brings one peace and happiness and it's the only way. Now when you're young you get a uh, the car keys. You think that's the key to your happiness. You're finally learning how to drive and you're going to go all around town and pick up babes. It's fun. I'll admit it. I've done it. It's fun. So you're driving around, and that's the keys to your happiness. But the true keys to your happiness lies in the Word of God. And that's where you can build up a capacity for life. When you take that young lady out on a date, you can treat her with respect, and you can uh, put all your lust aside, and you can have a wonderful time with that person. And if she turns out to be a flake, you can go on to somebody else. That's your choice. But it's a peaceful and wonderful thing to have the Word of God in your soul. And it's really the only way you're ever going to know happiness or peace in life is from the Word of God and putting it in your soul. Without doing that, you will never know happiness. And that doesn't mean you won't have problems as a believer. You will. You will go through extreme testing and, uh, but it'll get fun for you. You'll like living the spiritual life if you have uh, the capacity for it and the actual love for the Word of God. You will enjoy uh, being, it's like being in the military and they're shooting at you, and that's what they do in training. They, they really do shoot at you, except they go right above your head. And if you were to stand up and get scared, you're going to get killed. But that's how they train you. And in fact, you, if you're a military type person, you come to love that. You come to love that testing because you will uh, be a better soldier for it. And as a believer in Christ, when you uh, get under the firing squad and people are talking about you and gossiping about you and you're just having an awful time, well, you're not. But everybody, there's a lot of adversity. You don't have to have an awful time. But you can have a lot of adversity coming your way and you simply enjoy it. You say, this is a test. This is a time to utilize what I have learned. And when you do that, you realize that you're advancing in the spiritual life, you're passing these tests, and it's fun. And you say, how can being in pain fun? It's fun, believe me. It can be fun because you are passing a test. And once you get through that test, great blessing awaits, and it's a wonderful, wonderful life 
And all you have to do, it's not meritorious. You just have to sit and listen to the Word of God, put it in your soul, and then eventually you will function under a wonderful and unique spiritual life, and it will bring great peace and happiness to your life. Now, I seem to have gotten off track a little bit, but maybe I was supposed to. All right, verse 18. A right lobe that devises evil conspiracies and feet that run rapidly to evil. And that's what I did, talking about the people who reject authority. And then we have in verse 19, a false witness who utters lies, and he sows discord, that means strife, between the brethren, and that means among uh, believers in Jesus Christ. And, of course, we noted that a false witness was a person who committed perjury, because if you commit perjury... A false witness who lies makes it impossible to bring out the facts in a court case. And uh, the Jews had a wonderful system of jurisprudence, just as we do today. Now it has its imperfections, and we've failed a lot in this country because of our apostasy, but we still have the best judicial system in the world, and I hope it stays that way. And uh, if you stick with the doctrine, you, you'll be surprised what invisible impact you can have on the future of your country. And sowing discord or strife between the brethren refers to playing one person against another. And I hate to refer to work so much, but I, I see so many applications from there because, you know, I'm in a, a workplace with a lot of women, and, that, and women are responders, by the way. Uh, they were created as responders. And as responders, they... Uh, they love the idea of relationships, and they like to talk about it. And it's a, a part of them as, a, uh, as they were made. But uh, they have a, a weakness being responders in the area of gossip. Men gossip, too, by the way. I'm not letting men off the hook at all. They do. And if you find a man that gossips all the time, well, uh, he's a little prissy in my mind, but that's just my opinion. But everybody has the ability to gossip, of course. But it, it seems in my observation, women as responders have that uh, particular weakness in their souls just because of their makeup and the fact that they are responders. So, uh, as I was saying, they play one off the other. I'm not naming names, so this isn't gossip. But one lady will play another one off the other. In other words, this is what happens. The woman will go. The woman who is playing the two. Let's do this on the board. It'll be easier to explain. Here are three women, and this is the one playing one off the other up here. Here are three women. Now this woman goes to this woman, or man. You can make it. This man goes to this man, and she talks to her about this woman over here, and she takes it all in, and she agrees and says, "Aha." Yes, I agree with you. This person is terrible and disgusting over here. I agree with you. So th th she confides She confides in the woman. It's just three circles. She confides in the woman. And she takes it all in. Now this woman goes over here to this woman and says, This woman said all this about you. And then this woman says, all right, I say all this about her. And so she runs over here. She says all this about you. So this woman ends up with two friends, so she thinks, right here. Two people confiding in her. She gets two friendships because she's just agreeing with them. And she says, I really like this person. And this one over here says, I really like this person. Yet she's playing them off of each other. That's what it's saying. And that happens all the time. And I wouldn't have been able to illustrate that unless I went to work today. It's, it's amazing to me. I mean, the Bible tells it. It's right there. It's in real life. And I'm, wow. Sometimes I just, sometimes I just shake my head. This is what I'm teaching. This is what happens. It makes me wonder. All right. So uh, we were talking about uh, playing one off the other. You see, I get blind every time I do that, and I can't even see what I'm doing. I'm not complaining. It's just... <laughs> Whoa. All right. Second uh, Timothy, we're not there yet. Yes, we. What did I do? Verse 19. A false witness who utters lies. Yes, that was the jurisprudence. And the sowing discord and strife was, of course, the three uh, women and the one playing the two off the other. And then we have 
2 uh, Timothy 3 through 7. And now we're moving on to something different after 35 minutes. But repetition's good. Now we're moving on to something different. 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 7. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 7. Now this deals uh, specifically with uh, the Christian. Now Christians sin. We know this from 1 John 1, 8 and 1, 10. And by the time I'm done with you, you'll have 1 John 1, 8 through 10 memorized if you don't already. And, um, and that means we all do commit sin. And this deals specifically with the Christian. Now, verse 2 of chapter 3. For mankind will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Now, I just noted that up on the board with the vessels of honor versus the vessels of dishonor. The vessels of dishonor start out being disobedient to parents. And it's a, a very important point as it's found all throughout Scripture. And they are ungrateful and wicked. Now, to be a, mo a lover of money, as it says there, they are lovers of money. This doesn't mean you can't appreciate money. All of us need money. We use money to go to the grocery store and uh, feed our bellies. And some of us feed our bellies more than others. And that would be me. And then... Uh, <clears throat> we go and use money to enjoy it, and you can appreciate it. But the fact is, you are the master of your money. If your money ever becomes your master, in other words, you get sad because you look in your wallet and you got a buck when you want to have a hundred, well then, uh, that's a problem. You have to be the master of your money, and uh, not a lover of money, but you can appreciate money. Now, the, the sin in relationship to money has to do with stealing money, or being dishonest in monetary gain. And that's happening a lot now in our capitalistic society, which it should be capitalistic. Capitalism is the uh, greatest form. Actually, that is part of the divine establishment. Capitalism uh, does wonderful things. That's why we are the richest country on the face of the earth. And in fact, if you've ever been to uh, Mexico or if you've been outside of this country, you always come back with a great appreciation for these United States of America because through our capitalism we have built great wealth and great prosperity but most of all this wealth comes from our uh, blessing from a few people who have lived the unique spiritual life and capitalism is related to that and if we ever go into socialism that is a sign that our country has become more apostate I'm off subject. To be a lover of money doesn't mean to appreciate money, but it's talking about stealing money or being dishonest in monetary gain. And, and then we have the ungrateful part, and we live in a time when uh, people are very ungrateful, and I've seen this a lot. I hate to talk about young people so much, but I'm a young person, and I'm including myself in that because I grew up at a time of apostasy among young... Maybe there's a younger generation coming up that has a, a greater love or wants to get out of this uh, nastiness that is in our society. And uh, I do hope so. And uh, But uh, as I was saying, a lot of the uh, young people seem to be ungrateful when it comes to their parents, when it comes to any type of authority. There seems to be ungrateful. When I was in school, I remember I was completely shocked one day when a guy in algebra... Now, the teacher, I'll admit, was not a good teacher. She was... Uh, well, he, well, the guy... I'm going to tell you what she was because this is what the guy said she was. Under his... Not even under his breath. He said it out loud. Uh, we were in the middle of class and she was correcting him for something and he just looked at her and said, Bitch? And I thought, My goodness. You know, out, and she didn't do a thing. Now, that's the problem. There needs to be some authority there. Now, he might have been right in what he said, and in fact, um, he probably was, but that doesn't matter. She was the authority, and I was, I was taken aback by that. And this thing happens in schools all the time where there's a breakdown of authority, and it really, it really concerns me when it comes to our country when uh, young people can act like that. Back in the olden days, uh, like if I hear my father talk about it, well, they would have took that boy out. They wouldn't have cared if he was 16, and they would have wore his butt out, and they would have told his parents about it, and they would have wore his butt out by the time you're 16. If you're 16 and acting like that, you're already 
You can't see that. You're already a vessel of dishonor by the time you're 16 if you're acting like that. And that's a problem for our country, and that's why our jails are full. All right, now let's continue. So this is dealing with uh, Christian sins, and to be a lover of money doesn't mean you can't appreciate money. And then we have the ungratefulness. Let's move on to verse 4. They are treacherous, thoughtless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they hold to a form of godliness, although they have repudiated its power, a void such as these. Now that was verse 5. Now they hold to a form of godliness. What does that mean? You might run across some people who always have the right language, and you'll come across them and they'll say, Amen, brother. How are you today? And you'll say, I'm doing fine. And they'll say, uh, and then they'll say something else regarding, they'll say, well, hallelujah, I hope you have a good day, brother, by the name of the Lord. And they'll talk like this. And you say, well, that guy's pretty dang spiritual, ain't he? No, he's putting on a front in most cases. He's putting on a front, actually, probably in all cases, people don't talk like this because that would be kind of insane, don't you think? And just walking up to somebody, and yet I've seen people do it. And that, they do it at the, the holiness churches and other churches. And um, they use the language to get attention from people. They want people to see them as spiritual, and that's a sin. That is called approbation lust. And what is approbation? Approval. When you seek the approval of people, you are sinning. Now, this happens all the time in many different ways. And that doesn't mean uh, if you comb your hair, you're in approbation lust. No, you're making yourself acceptable to all of society, and to comb your hair and to be clean and to do all of that, well, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, don't get freaky with it and just uh, don't get weird with what I'm saying. Uh, just keep it in the realm of common sense and the fact that you don't have to impress people. And when you're trying to impress people and uh, uh, by doing something like say, Amen, Hallelujah, Brother, if the Lord willing, I'll be there tomorrow morning. And if uh, people who act like that, they're hiding something. They're hiding a great evil. And they're hiding a great self-righteousness. They think so highly of themselves. And these people know nothing, absolutely nothing of grace. And what does the Bible say? It says, avoid such as these. You see somebody acting like that? Run! <laughs> Get away! Now, uh, I won't say anything about that. All right, but there is uh, superficiality in this. And superficiality is a problem around the world and in this country, of course. Superficiality, and a part of that has to do with them saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Well, that's just them being superficial, holding to a superficial form of the spiritual life. Now, when I was younger, I played the violin for school. And I had a little aside job that I would do. And that is I would play the violin for weddings or whatever. And I made quite a bit of money on the side. It was better than working at the bilo or something. And I really enjoyed it. And so one time I was called to uh, go to a wedding. And I went to the wedding and I pulled out my violin and I was uh, tuning it up, getting ready to play. And the lady there, uh, the lady of a pretty 15-year-old girl, I was 17. And there was a pretty 15-year-old girl there. And the lady was there, and she looked at me, and she said, uh, Help me put out these chairs. Well, I, I was there to be paid to play the violin. So I just looked at her like she was crazy and sat down and kept tuning my violin. That wasn't part of my job description. She wasn't even the lady over the whole thing anyway. And so she was being real snotty. Uh, Help me put out these chairs and do the... And I sat down, and she gave me the evilest look like I had just done something horrible. Well, I was there to do a job that somebody else had hired me for, and they had hired me to play my violin, not set out chairs. So I sat down and watched her put up the chairs and enjoyed watching it. And then, and then after I played, I played, uh, it's called uh, the canon in D, and that's what everybody likes to hear at their wedding. Beep, beep, beep. I won't sing, I don't. But uh, if I could play it on here, I would uh, illustrate. You would know it. It's uh, what they play at all the weddings. And I played it, and I finished it, and I did a good job. I'm not bragging. I'm telling the truth. I did a good job. And uh, so afterwards, well, this lady 
who had just been so nasty to me, came up to me and put her arm around me. And she walked me over to her daughter, 15-year-old daughter. She thought I was going somewhere because I could play the violin. Well, I wasn't going anywhere doing that. She didn't know it. She was going to use me. And she wanted me to get with her daughter. And her daughter was pretty, but she was 15. And when you're 17 and then there's 15, there's a big difference. But when she's pretty, you don't care. But I wasn't into that superficial stuff. And I knew what this lady was up to. She wanted uh, to use me. Now, she had just been mean. And now she's being nice. Why? Because she saw a little bit of talent. So what? What's talent? You're born with it. What's good looks? You're born with good looks. If you grow up handsome, well, good for you. But you had nothing to do with it. And somebody comes up to you and say, My, you're a handsome young man. You say, Thank you. Out of kindness, you say, Thank you. But really, you had nothing to do with it. You came out of, uh, you came out of the womb and uh, you happened to be pretty or beautiful or handsome not because of who and what you are. You were just born that way. And if somebody's ugly, bless their heart, well, they can't help it. They were born that way. And so we need to get away from this uh, superficiality. Everybody's superficial. And, you know, if you find a woman, maybe she's not the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth. Maybe she is. But if you find a woman who has a lot of integrity, and I'm talking spiritual integrity, then you have found a gem. I don't care what she looks like. You have found a gem. Because when you get older, I can tell you this, I see it in people. When you get older, you, you're not so pretty anymore. You lose all of that. And uh, sometimes you can get married uh, to a very beautiful woman. And if you marry her only on the basis of her beauty, in 10 years she could gain 500 pounds. It's happened. And then you are with a 500-pound woman. And if she has nothing in her soul then what do you have? You need, um, you can't be superficial. And when you hold to a form of godliness, when you hold to a form of that, it's being superficial. You're looking at people on the basis of how they act on the outside, and uh, you don't know anything about their inside. And you need to know something about people's insides, uh, not their guts and stuff, but the inside of their soul. And that's what you need to know. And so they hold to a form of godliness, and that means they talk a good fight. They are full of pious amens and hallelujahs. And then the power of godliness, what's the power of godliness? The power is the filling of God the Holy Spirit. How do we have the filling of God the Holy Spirit? First John 1 John 1.9, if we're out of fellowship, we name our sin to God, and we are put in fellowship. Now I'm going to go blind here for a couple more minutes, but I got it. I want to show you something. When we believe in Christ, oh, there's nothing on there. When we believe in Christ, we are, we have what is called eternal security. And you're immediately put into a circle. Now, why is it a circle? Because you can't get out of a circle. If you're in here, you, you can't get out of here. But this uh, circle, and then here's another circle. Now this circle has a little opening. All right. Now if you're in the top circle, you are saved. And that's called positional sanctification. You are saved. You have believed in Jesus Christ. And you are, is that the top or bottom circle? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Well, you are. Well, I'll do my own illustration then. You're in the. Uh, you're in this circle here. You are saved. Now, well, actually, the moment you are saved, you are in this circle because when you believe in Christ, all of your sins are wiped out. Now, it won't be long before you're moving around in this circle. You're going to commit a sin, and you might not even know you do it. So you're sucked into here, and now you're in a state of carnality. Now, this is up here called positional sanctification. You cannot lose your salvation. If you sin, you're in here. You're still saved. And then when you rebound, let's put another opening here, and then you rebound, you're back in here. What is this circle out here called? That circle is experiential, experiential sanctification. And that means your Christian way of life. So in here you're saved, but you're in sin. And in here you are um, in the filling of God the Holy Spirit and living the spiritual life and utilizing the power of God the Holy Spirit. 
And so by rejecting the power, what they have done is they have moved in here and they stay in here and they're trying to live the spiritual life in here. But the spiritual life is out here after you rebound. And this is where you can learn the spiritual life through Operation Z. That means to listen to your pastor, to take it into your soul, and God the Holy Spirit will convert gnosis, that is knowledge in the Greek, into epinosis, which means beyond knowledge. And what is beyond knowledge? It's pneumatikos, spiritual phenomenon. And that's ugly. Maybe I should stop writing. I need to practice all my writing, <coughs> writing skills. I type all the time, so I never need to write. So I've lost my ability to write. All right. Let's move on now to verse 6. we got ten minutes. For among them are those who creep into households. We studied this a while back. For among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women, weighed down with sins led on by various lusts. And we've noted this before. Verse 7, always learning. That means they are learning gnosis. They are learning. Now, gnosis, it's like food on a table. If you have food on a table, it is uh, not beneficial to you, but it's there. And uh, you can name the food. Well, there's an apple. There's uh, some type of vegetable. There's a piece of meat, a good filet mignon steak. And you can name it all. Well, that's gnosis. It's knowledge. You know what it is. But it does you no good. It gives you no power uh, for the body unless you eat it. And when you eat it, that is epinosis. And that is, a, and as by way of analogy, that is a knowledge of doctrine, a, knowledge, a true knowledge of doctrine. Now, you can know doctrine, and a lot of, I've met people, I'll tell you the truth, I've met people who know uh, every terminology there is in theology, and uh, yet they don't live the spiritual life. How is this? They've never really believed it. And they've never been able to be filled with God the Holy Spirit because they've always been in sin. And so they go to Bible class, hear these terms, know what they are, never use them, never convert them to beyond knowledge, which is pneumatika, spiritual phenomenon, and therefore they're still failures. And I've seen people like that. It's a phenomenal thing. And that's because there's a kink in their soul, and that kink is they are not operating under the power of of God the Holy Spirit. They're sitting in class under jealousy or inordinate ambition. Remember, that means excessive. Or inordinate competition. They're sitting in class thinking about something else, hearing a bit here and there, and uh, in a state of sin, and therefore they get the terminology, but they never understand fully what it means, and they never utilize it in their spiritual life. Therefore, they are losers as believers. And you can meet some of these people and you would think they were very spiritual until uh, they do you wrong in some way or until, uh, and then of course you just utilize the faith rest drill and other things which we haven't gotten to. But uh, you will see this in your life that you will run into people who have a knowledge of doctrine but uh, it never gets to epinosis because they've never been filled with God the Holy Spirit. And that's the important. That means you're spiritual. When you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, if you've just believed in Christ and you just learned rebound and you don't know much about the Word of God at all, yet uh, you rebound quite a bit when you recognize the sin that you've committed, you, as soon as you do that, you are spiritual. You might not be a mature believer, but you are spiritual, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit. And that is very important to understand. Outside of the Spirit, if you are grieving and quenching and squelching God the Holy Spirit, you can't learn a thing in class. You might get gnosis. That's like food on the table. But you need to eat it and uh, convert it into uh, epinosis in your soul. Now, there's a verse in the Bible that says in Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, I ate thy word. And there were, there's been some crazy people in crazy churches where they actually take the Bible and start eating it with their mouth. And... Uh, that's not what it means. It means to eat the word, as in uh, you're eating the food on the table, turning gnosis into epinosis. And epinosis is that beyond knowledge, that is spiritual phenomenon, pneuma tikos. Let's move now to the sins that are, um, I won't say that. Let's move to the sexual sins. The sexual sins, the Bible forbids fornication. 
which is committed by an unmarried person. And fornication is prohibited in the Scripture by 1 Corinthians 6.18. 1 Corinthians 6.18 prohibits fornication. And in 1 Thessalonians 4.3. And the Corinthians have much to say about fornication because this was uh, their uh, type of... uh, Well, that was their background. They had the heathen temples in Corinthia, and as unbelievers, they would visit these temples all the time. And actually, it was a place where they could get free. It was free. They didn't even have to pay for it. They would go in and have uh, free sex with the harlots there, and that was part of their sacrifice to the gods, and that was the religion that they were under. And when they became believers in Christ, that was their background, and that remained their weakness. At times, they still had a desire to go down and get uh, free sex from the temple even after they believed in Christ. So this was a problem for the Corinthian church. And um, it was free and it was part of their religion uh, before they believed in Christ. And that's uh, what they did and that was their um, area of weakness. And that's why 1 Corinthians 6.18 forbids fornication because Paul addressed that problem to them. So fornication was rather rampant in the Corinthian church, and it is addressed, therefore, in Corinthians, and fornication is a sin for any of us. And adultery, too, is prohibited. And adultery is sex committed by married persons, and that means uh, they're married and they have sex with someone outside of their marriage. And that's found in Exodus 20.14 and Deuteronomy 5.18. And then we have mental adultery, which we touched on briefly last week. And a mental adultery can be committed at any time by anybody. All they have to do is put that mental image in their head and then uh, commit fornication or adultery with that person, and that is a sin. And that's found in Matthew 5.27-28. through 28. And that's when Jesus was uh, talking to the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. And the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites would never think of committing actual adultery, yet they looked at women all the time and had adultery with those women in their minds. So um, Jesus is telling them, you're a sinner. You act so pious. You go around saying, I would never commit adultery, yet you're doing it all the time in your mind. In other words, You're a sinner. And they were pious about the fact, but Jesus knew they were sinners and he would actually go to the cross and die as a substitute for all such sins. So it is prohibited mental adultery in Matthew 5, 27 through 28. And of course, mental adultery can... It's very possible to commit mental adultery far more than it is um, the regular adultery where you actually go through the act Physically, uh, you can commit mental adultery all day if you have that type of imaginative imaginative and perverse mind. And you can do that, and that is part of sin. Now, incest is a sin, too, and you say, well, what about Adam and Eve? Well, incest is sex committed between family members. And you say, well, Adam and Eve had some family members. They had children. They had to have sex with each other. Well, yes, that's true. But then it was prohibited later in the Bible. For example, things change, and we'll be studying this in dispensations. The plan of God for each dispensation, it's different. So when Adam and Eve uh, had their children, and then their children had sex with each other, which would be considered today incest, it was not sin then because... Uh, They were under a different system. In fact, there was no nation then. There was not enough people for a nation. Yet, nationalism is part of the fourth divine institution. And they did not have nationalism. Nationalism did not come until later. And that's the Tower of Babel. And what they did is they uh, suddenly started speaking different languages. And uh, they were greatly confused. And they started fighting amongst each other. And therefore, nations were established. The people who spoke uh, of one type of language went to one part of the earth, and then the people who spoke another uh, language went to another part of the earth over here. 
and that's how it was separated out. And therefore, there was an establishment of nationalism. There had not yet been the establishment that incest was a sin. But later it was established because the human race had been populated and God established it uh, through uh, Moses' writings. And that is found in Leviticus 18, 16 through 17 that incest is forbidden. Also Deuteronomy 27, 20. And believe it or not, today there are believers in Christ who commit incest. Remember, a believer can commit any sin, an unbeliever can commit, because within us is the old sin nature. And we studied that, as it said, the members of our body. The sin nature is in our body. We cannot eradicate it. It tempts us, and we will sin, as per 1 John 1, 1.8 and 1 John 1.10. And don't be shocked. Uh, you might be shocked by your own sins, and that might shock you to rebound. Uh, but don't be, well, first of all, don't be shocked by other people's sins. Uh, concern yourself with yourself first, and actually don't bother with other people's sins. If you're shocked by what somebody else's do, that's going to create a problem in your spiritual life, because your eyes are not on God, they are on people. And people emphasis over God emphasis is a terrible problem in this country, and that's why people go to church for social life, instead of the Word of God. Social life is fine. But if you want to have a great social life, go to a bar. Don't go to a church. A church is where there is a doctrine to be taught. Now, I'm not telling you to go to a bar. I'm doing an illustration. Uh, don't go out to a bar for social life. You can have great social life without going to a bar. But if that's all you're looking for, it'd be a lot more fun. All right. So... At church, a church is a place where you should learn doctrine. Now, this is a bit of a different teaching than what you would be used to because uh, you're used to a little bit of holiness. I'm going to give it to you plainly. That's all. I can't. I'm just going to do it plain and because that's the way it should be taught. And I think it gives you a greater understanding of grace when it's given out plainly. And, uh, and if you're shocked by saying, go to a bar, well... I can't say anything for you. You shouldn't be shocked by sin. People sin. People get drunk. You, you were, you're shocked by that, but people gossip and you laugh about that. It's sin, and gossip is worse than drunkenness. And that's just the way it is. So the power of God, and that's what it says in the Bible. I'm not making it up in my mind. So the power of godliness is the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And verse 6, I told you about, no, we are on down through uh, now incest, which is Deuteronomy 27.20, and believers commit incest. The next uh, sexual sin we are going to cover, wow, it's 8.01. You're going to miss American Idol. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We'll continue with this uh, Thursday night. I can't believe I only went through one page of notes. All right, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity we have this evening to study your word. May the things which we have studied tonight be a source of blessing and challenge to us. May we understand what sins are so that we can have a uh, better realization and our conscience can strike us when we commit those sins that we might have not considered uh, sins. And therefore, we can live a life under the filling of God the Holy Spirit in which we are spiritual and we can come to glorify you, which is the only purpose that we are alive now on this earth. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.